The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, that demonstration I had been to was for the peace in Lebanon during the war in 2006. And so it wasn't, there was no like reason for so much police to be, to be there. We were there to ask for peace in the region. So it wasn't about revolution or toppling the president or whatever. So, so um, I was really shocked that there was this, you know, this really ridiculous kind of uh, uh, fear from the, the Amn al-Dawla, the, the state security. And... Um, and of course, what they, what happens is that when somebody makes a little gesture and there's like a panic movement, and of course the police takes advantage of it and and, and panics because they're 17 years old. Also, the policemen. I mean, they're terrified and everybody's terrified. And but except they're armed and they start beating people up and and arresting people. So from there, I thought on the 25th of Jan, I thought I'm not going down. I've you know I know what's gonna do, what what's gonna end up happening. I'm gonna get beaten up and. And um, and then I realized I'm like everybody else. I'm afraid, and the whole point of the revolution was to break that fear. It was really that suddenly nobody was afraid anymore, and that we actually really went. And the fact that we were all together in the street was like, okay, we're not afraid because also we are all together, and it was really extraordinary. But I also saw that I wasn't a photographer anymore. You know, I had like. 25 years ago, began my career as a photographer and kind of got a little bit out of it from, you know, see, watching digital cameras and, and everybody, you know, becoming a photographer was also part of my sort of how I evolved as an artist. And so I moved into using images, but not so much being so, you know, focused on making images. So, so the, for me, my role in the, in the revolution was to really be there as an Egyptian and to be there as a person who loves that country and who wants to really see something through in that movement. So I really put myself as an artist, like actually outside of everything. And for quite a long time, just watched. I participated, I was there, I, I met people, I helped people, I was in the square all the time, but I did not... Um, take lead in a way. I did not produce art or I did not, you know, I didn't want to do anything. I just thought this is too much, you know, I need to kind of process what's going on. So it's much later in the process that I started to kind of um, take action in a way or, or different action than being a citizen demonstrating. Um, and this is when these other, uh, uh, you know, Tahrir Cinema and uh, uh, sort of... Um, very time-based uh, experiences sort of happened, but, but that will talk uh, about a bit later. But my role, really, I saw my role as someone who could, uh, from my experience and the community that I know, someone who could really connect people to each other and also watch a lot of younger people than me and see that I could really, I had the experience that they didn't have, but they had maybe the tools and the ways to operate that I also my generation didn't have. You know, my generation was much more individualistic and also a little bit like a satellite. We worked as like, we were ap apolitical in a way. Like we were sort of, I think we were, a lot of us were a little bit outside of the political sphere because that wasn't the way to, to operate at the time. So to watch suddenly this new generation come in and be, very, very strong about their political views and using social media and so on, was like, okay, what can I give that they don't have? And, and so it was really great because I, I met a lot of people and I, I, I worked in that way with a lot of people. So it was a very organic uh, time in that sense. And um, it led to a lot of things which we'll talk about. But, yeah, uh, we have a lot to talk about. Um, in the classroom last week, we were asking ourselves, what is an activist? Um, how much someone should be involved in a cause to be a, call, to qualify as an activist. And we were comparing anonymous members with Aaron Schwartz, and we were concluding that Aaron Schwartz was much more dedicated to the cause than people who just do sit in, online sit-in uh, from time to time. Um, I guess my question would be, in this case, 
are all protesters activists in the context of a revolution? And do you consider yourself as an activist? And when does the artist become an activist? So no, not every protester is an activist, for sure not. I think every protester is a citizen. Every protester that comes to uh, a demonstration doesn't necessarily know why they're coming to a demonstration, but I mean, this is a huge discussion. But in the case of Tahrir, a lot of people, you know, there was something kind of um, almost, I mean, almost funny when you look at it in retrospect, is that, I don't know if you remember, if you know, but the... The, on the 25th of Jan, the first group of people go and demonstrate. On the 26th and 27th, um, they, the, the main activists um, of that first demonstration uh, start to kind of confuse the police and exhaust the police, which was a technique. On the 28th of Jan, everybody is called to come to the square, on a, it's a Friday. In Egypt, Friday is the equivalent of a Sunday. Um, on the 27th, at night, before this Friday, where everybody's on holiday, nobody's going to go to work, so it's much more scary for the government because they know more people are free to go demonstrating. Um, the, 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 you know, the tension was growing throughout the country, not just in Cairo. And at 7 p.m., there was rumors that the government would uh, stop our telephones and internet. At 9 p.m., we couldn't talk to each other on the phone. We could only text. At 11 p.m., we couldn't text. At 6 a.m., we couldn't email anybody or open internet. So it's kind of stupid because, you know, what do you do when you don't have internet, telephone, and, and you don't have a landline anymore? What's your natural, what's your natural instinct? Yeah. You go out, try to talk to a human being. You know? yeah. So it's in a funny way, almost, I would say, it's like it's almost the government help initiate this <laughs> by shutting us down. And so, of course, we're all going to go look for each other. So everybody goes down to the street in their area and talks to each other and say, OK, what's going on? OK, ah, let's go to Tahrir. Because, of course, we already know that there are uh, demonstrations going on. So most of the people are already informed that there are demonstrations and marches that will start after the, the Friday prayer at uh, 1 o'clock from a lot of the main mosques around the cities. But most of the people who are not part of these marches necessarily will sort of naturally join. And so this is what happened. So people found out about um, the reasons why this is happening, how this is shaping itself as it was happening. There was no real... Um, it's not like everybody knew why they were going down. So, so people found themselves activists maybe after five days, ten days, maybe overnight. So an, a good example, and he's here at Harvard if you have a chance to go maybe meet him or find out about him. But there's somebody like a good example is um, Basim Youssef, who is um, a comic now that's compared to John Stewart in, in the U.S. But he was a heart surgeon. He was a doctor, he's studying, I think he was still like finishing his studies or something, and or a very early practi practitioner. He, he filmed himself talking about what was happening, posted the video on YouTube, three months later had already five million people watching him, and then a month later a TV that came out of the revolution, so a free channel, asked him to do a show. And he became like a really famous figure over the period of two years that followed. So this is an example of someone who's a citizen, but then becomes an activist, but then becomes, you know, finds a new voice for so himself. So it's a fluid category, kind of. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, everybody changed their life. Like, uh, I mean, everybody, maybe a lot of people. But, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, we all lost our friends and made new friends. Because suddenly when you can talk about politics, you realize that you don't get along with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, oops, uh, I don't think so. And this is such a huge, impactful moment in history. You cannot make a uh, compromise. You know, there's no time for it. There's no energy for it. And it's going so fast and it's so intense. You have to go to what you believe for. And so, and so you make choices. And these choices, you know, you watch people like sort of drop out of your life. And, you know, suddenly you're completely negotiating a completely different... So this is not fixed, you know, what you are and how you, you know, how you even that. And to, 
talk about how an artist becomes, uh, you know, what an artist does in a revolution. I mean, this this example that's behind me is um, a piece that I did in uh, 2007, and the revolution started in 2011. Uh, to give you a configuration of Cairo, you have those famous uh, lions that you see in the picture are the entry of uh, the entrance of a bridge of a famous bridge called the Athrun Nil Bridge. Ath means bridge. Uh, so the Nile Bridge, and in front of those uh, those lions actually is Tahrir. So it's a landmark, a little bit like the pyramids or the Eiffel Tower. You know, it's a famous area in Cairo, and people would naturally go visit it. Um, and so in 2007, I made uh, this piece, which is called Justice for the Mother. Egypt in Arabic is mother, um, is called uh, the mother of the world, Um uh, Dunya. Um, and, and so this work was really um, a work about, uh, it was actually a portrait of my father and a portrait of the law of the jungle, you know, the, the, the strongest is always the one that wins a fight. So, but while I was doing this work and sort of studying like the kind of psychology of how human beings kind of fight each other and who wins and who loses, uh, uh, using these kind of uh, images that I've collected uh, in my work, I, I attended this demonstration I told you about, so where this huge cordon of police was circling us. And I was really shocked by it because nobody in that demonstration had the same purpose. Uh, there was maybe five or six people who were actually there for Lebanon, but really people were there because either they were passing by or they were activists or they were, you know, asking for the bread to be less expensive. I mean, everybody had a kind of different cause and purpose. And so this sort of like weird um, incoherence of that demonstration really stuck with me. And so this was a parody. So this is a detail of the piece where it's a parody of people demonstrating and asking for something. But, you know, everybody seems to be like on their own. Um, so you can see John Travolta, which is not your uh, generation. But it's a little bit mine. Um, Condalisa Rice during the war, the war in Lebanon, so with bombs and missiles that say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, and all kinds of characters that seem to be like revolting. Um, and so, interestingly, when the Tahrir started, it was, you know, suddenly I look at my work and I think, you know, what am I supposed to do now that there is this huge revolution or uprising happening? Am I supposed to work? And I'm watching all these kids and all these people produce, even citizens, not just artists, but citizens producing videos and uploading footage and making jokes and doing like this crazy, amazing stuff. And I don't work like this. I work, you know, I take time to work and I worked under a dictatorship. So in a way, my work was shaped by the stagnant regime under which I was working and which I was trying to also sort of mirror by saying, by, you know, by making works that kind of demand attention and, in a sense, are heavy sometimes, but that mirrored that kind of rigidity of the regime I was working under. And looking back at this work as one of the works was really funny because I was like, wow, I depicted a kind of problematic paradise, you know, behind those lions, which is, a, it's actually a portrait of Tahrir. And... Um, and that's how it felt, you know, that's how the, the being in the 18 days in the square really felt like there was a, a very, there was a possible world that we hadn't, we had to experience. And we were experiencing in very small moments. But that, those moments were, this is a possibility, this is a seed of something that could happen maybe in 2000 years, maybe in 200 years, maybe in 10 years, we don't know, maybe tomorrow, I have no idea, but it's possible. And it's that sort of sense that really um, was really interesting for me. And I, it took me a long time to kind of think, okay, how do I work now? Um, so this is also another question, because then I start collecting footage and, and working with archive and collecting images. But I wanted to show this as a kind of relationship to how, you know, the world changed overnight. And so there was a moment of, you know, of reflection and kind of, absorbing what was happening before doing things. This was made before the revolution. Yes, 2007, and four kind of, years before. I think it kind of shows that your work 
was already political before the revolution, even though you didn't really notice there was something political. No, I did notice. <laughs> <laughs> I I did notice, but it was it was just a different language I was using. I mean, this this work. I mean, this is Cairo. I want to show you like these are informal areas in Cairo, um, which are basically illegal constructions and slums. And this was a tower that I built in the Opera House in the center of Cairo, which is a military base and which is where the Biennial of Art takes place, used to take place. And so this work was directly a kind of, you know, statement to the government to say, okay, the subject of your Biennial is the others. So what are you doing with the others? Who are the others in relationship to the government? They're all the people they're not addressing. They're not addressing the issues that these people have and face every day. And so I built an informal tower, a slum tower, in the middle of the garden of this military base. I made my own brick. You can see the donkey here, and it says hope on it. And here you can see the tower at night with the opera house just behind. And of course, this was like, I, you know, this was very controversial because it was like, wow, you know, like putting people, put, you know, you don't go there, so I'm going to bring there to you. So, and this was really at, you know, at the, what, like a year before the revolution, a year and a half before the revolution. So this work was really, really, like really loaded and, mm -hmm. and, and very much discussed later as a kind of movement in the art world as how artists were putting their, you know, saying, you know, hello, alert, alert, beep, beep. You mm -hmm. know, there's something, there's something happening here that you need to, to look at. So this was the, the kind of landscape we were in when the revolution started in terms of the, the art scene. Yes, Ali. Well, I just wanted to know, the first one that you showed, the Justice to the Mother, were you inspired by Bosch? That's what everybody always tells me. It was me. so similar. Thank you very much. It's always a very beautiful compliment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I actually love painting. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a painter, and I... You know, wish I could be, but I, I'm sure I will be at some point. And <laughs> I've made other people paint for me because in Egypt we have this tradition of making uh, uh, painted billboards for cinema. I mean, in the good old days, it, they still existed like this. So, but but um, yes, a lot of people compare my work to to Bosch because of the the kind of um, you know the delights. I mean, the paradise depiction. But actually, when you get closer to it, it shows all the disruption that are happening in this depiction of paradise and how in fact it's closer to hell. Yeah. Um, like the, the three triptychs, I really, I saw the, the similarities between like the green expanse, but also like the, the two lions separated into like a very, uh, very pale piece. And also it just, it seemed very similar. And I really like that. The card number I really liked the green. It was like a very easy to look at. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so now we'll enter in the, you know, the, the discussion that we're supposed to have today about, uh, related to the assign readings. Um, and what I did actually is that I used the assign readings to build my questions. And I'm going to use these questions as a pretext to kind of push in a, a little bit of theory. <laughs> so it looks more like a course than uh, just a casual discussion. And then after we'll try to connect this to your experience as someone who experimented the, the revolution. So um, the first thing I would like to talk about is the rise of digital rebellion, citizen journalism and cyber left, uh, which did not start with the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement, but started 12 years before with the creation of ND Media, um, which is a global federated network of independent media centers, radio stations, newspapers, video collectives, and website, and uh, Indie Media was originally funded um, as an alternative and a direct uh, challenge to corporate media like CBS, uh, CNN, um, mostly to report on the counter demonstration uh, and the police brutality that took place during um, the 1999 World Trade Organization meetings. And during its first week, the website um, received 1.5 million hits, outpacing CNN uh, website for the same period. So it was quite something. It was really big. 
Um, and as the platform developed, it became more than an alternative media outlet, but also a think tank, an activist laboratory, a mobilizing tool for the anti-globalization movement. So for those who don't remember, the anti-globalization movement was against free trade agreements that would be at the disadvantage of the poorest. Um, and so this platform was allowing people, uh, different movement, different struggle to kind of merge together on a, the same platform. Um, movement as diverse as the um, Zapatista Mayan peasant uh, army from the poorest region of Mexico, uh, the South Central Farmer Movement in LA, a movement against Walmart in Philadelphia, and movement against war in Iraq. So it was very diverse, but it was all converging on this, this platform here. Um, and at, at that time, the activists were using chat rooms, listserv, wiki pages where people could uh, upload the, their stories, their reports, their pictures, their videos. Um, and so Andy Media was really one of the, the, the first websites where hundreds of people were uploading content, uh, generating content. And in, in this book, um, Digital Rebellion, Todd Wolfson claims that Indie Media, with its slogan, Don't Hate the Media, Be the Media, was kind of a precursor, a catalyst for the social media, but also the grassroots journalism, the citizen journalism. Um, Lara, uh, in your article, When Seeing is Belonging, that is very good, and I recommend everybody to read it. It's online. Um, you argue that the se September 11 also contributed to the rise of citizen journalism. Uh, do you want to tell us a little more about this idea? <laughs> Yes, I mean, I I wrote this uh, this article because I because of my um, relationship to photography and how this is how I began my career. But and I found my you know it was quite shocking to watch everybody. Can I go back to mm -hmm. some of these images to watch everybody take photos in the square? Yeah, like yeah. this is quite an interesting image. So. You know, watching this kind of scene, and I was myself holding a camera that was actually broken, so it was like kind of making scratch, uh, it had scratch like that, and I was like, hmm, you know, look at everybody's really documenting this, and I looked back at my life and thinking, okay, what do I do now, you know, because I felt a bit frozen, as, as I described the way I work is, I need time, and in a moment where you're in the middle of a you know, when the dam br breaks, the, the river goes really, really fast. And so you better be your head out of the water and, and go, you know, go with the flow, um, which when, you know, in a stagnant regime, it's more like being in a lake that is very stagnant and you have to keep going down and kind of trying to move the sail so that something happens. So it's a very different situation. So that sense made me look back and maybe look back at photography and the use of media and the use of image making, the history of image making. And I remembered starting photography when I was um, coming out of school and the first Gulf War started. And that was a moment in media where uh, the, the war in Iraq was uh, shown live on CNN. And that was one of the only channels that was actually filming, but you could never see anything, it was always dark. And like little lights would come out and, and you didn't know what was going on. It was just like you could see explosions or, or, or. But that was a really important moment in terms of discussing and debating the role of media and, and, and watching war life on television. Ten years later, there was 9-11. Um, uh, and I don't know how old you guys were, but it was a time when social media didn't exist. Most uh, people didn't have mobile phones, and if they did have mobile phones, they didn't have cameras on their mobile phones. So what was much more um, the thing of the time was to have a digital camera in your bag, and it was usually very low resolution, but it was nevertheless digital. And it was the early days of like creating media digital, uh, uh, in digital form. So suddenly, 10 years later, here I am in the middle of this revolution and watching everybody upload material I mean as fast as I'm talking there's like already a thousand videos that would have been uploaded so so this this whole you know this you know over 20 years but every decade this new platform that image making reaches was for me really really fascinating and yes one of the things that came out of the discourses and the debates around photography and image making and media in general in uh, 
after 9-11 was that for the first time in years, um, the power had changed hands, where the citizen, the ones who were underneath or very close or watching from um, uh, you know, uh, buildings and over windows, uh, were able to document what was happening the media wasn't there. They managed to come as fast citizens. And that was a real, real big moment in history in terms of suddenly the citizen had power that the, the media didn't have anymore. So that whole has the power and in whose hand is always at the core, I think, at the heart of those debates, especially in moments like that. So it was very interesting. And this is what, I mean, this is where I, I speak about citizen journalism and how and why that moment in Tahrir was really interesting for me because I had, I had seen this throughout my career as a photographer and artist and watched that and I was really fascinated with it. Okay, uh, let's talk about the role of media in mobilizing people. Um, so Facebook and Twitter are often depicted as main the main instruments of the, the Arab revolution to the point that the, uh, the revolution has been called a social media revolution, a Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution, and apparently one of the main idea, uh, one of the main element that contributed to um, this um, motivating, uniting the young Egyptian that were not, as you said, necessarily uh, into politics at that time, uh, was this Facebook page that we spoke about earlier. Uh, we are all Khaled Said. I know I don't pronounce it well, but I, I can't. Well. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, and apparently, well, this page was protesting again the death of this young blogger after his arrest by the police, as you said, uh, even showing picture of his disfigured corpse, mm -hmm. I think, at the beginning, I guess, maybe. Um, and um, according to the author of the, one of the texts that we had to read today, Jor Bodo, um, this page was successful because it individualized uh, Facebook interaction um, by talking, I think he was talking as if he was uh, Khaled Said actually, at the beginning. And at some point uh, during the revolution, apparently it became a kind of a, a place to collect evidences against the, the regime and against the, the police brutality, uh, and a sort of megaphone that was rel relaying information about uh, events that were coming. Um, and apparently it, it also served to build up the confidence about the movement. So my question was, when, like, so you when did you see this page for the first time and how did it affect your motivation to kind of get involved and uh, do you believe that um, uh, when you saw that did you be did you believe that there was a, like an, uh, an important oppositional movement that was kind of rising in Egypt was it the proof that something was going on kind of? um. So that's a nice question because I was not on Facebook when the revolution <laughs> started. So I had no idea even like why people even went on Facebook. It was just I could hear my friend talk about it and I was just horrified. And I was like, oh, I'm not going there. <laughs> um, so no, I was not on Facebook. I did not have a Twitter account. I didn't even know Twitter existed. I knew about Facebook. but um, And I didn't have a television. I still don't. So, and you know, my relationship with internet was... You know, it was a good relationship, but it wasn't like a very, like, I wasn't like a, a freak kind of server on, you know, surfer on the net. It wasn't like I was spending hours looking for things or using it in ways that I use it now. So, um, so I wasn't aware of that page. Um, I remember when Khalid Saeed was killed and I felt something is about to happen. And this was maybe eight months before the revolution started. It was in June 2010. The revolution started in January 2011. Um, what I can say, I mean, of course, I, I, I saw the page later mm -hmm. and I think it had an extraordinary impact. But I think the interesting story here, which um, if you go back to some of the images, um, the interesting story here is how this Facebook page began. Because we're not talking about making a Facebook page in, you know, this is Khalid Said. So we're not talking about making a Facebook page now or, you know, in a normal kind of situation or in a kind of relatively normal situation. I don't know what the normal situation would be. Um, we're talking about a Facebook page 
under Mubarak regime and at the end of the Mubarak regime, Amn al-Dawla, the state security, was incredibly powerful, probably one of the most powerful securities in, for sure in the region and probably across many other countries in the world. So you're talking about a very corrupted time in history and a very, very intense time where there is no way anybody could say who they were or say anything against the regime because they would be immediately arrested, let alone on Facebook, which is a public space, as you know. So um, the story goes that uh, there was the administrator of Google, Egypt, who was in Dubai for a conference, uh, who's a young guy who's now in LA, Wael Ghanem. And uh, one of the activists of one of the very small but very new and probably obviously very important that became very important uh, opposition group, political opposition group that formed itself and called itself 6th of April, um, formed itself uh, after the events that took place in 2010 of all the workers in the Delta, in the north of Egypt, that rebelled against the conditions of what, how they were working and how much they were paid and so on. And a lot of these people were killed, a lot of them were arrested. It was pretty much, um, it was one of the very important moments uh, pre-revolution that, uh, that marked, you know, this real disruption between the corrupted regime and the people. And so after that day, that group formed itself. So one of the people from that group was in that same conference and sat next to Wael Hunim but didn't tell him who he was and Wael Hunim didn't tell him who he was. They were just on internet and as people do it in internet cafe or when they have, you know, like you guys were at the beginning of the class, they, they sort of sit together, Google stuff and sometimes talk. And at one point, one of them said, you know, like how can we get people to actually participate, how do we, how do we collect people? How do we bring people's attention? You know, what, what do we do? And so Wael told him, you know, let's make this Facebook page, and you can do this and you can do that, and that's the way that you kind of attract people's attention. So I don't know what was the conversation exactly. I wish I was there. I wasn't, but from that conversation and not knowing each other and still not knowing each other afterwards, that's how they created this Facebook page and people started to join and like and like and like and before we knew it there was thousands of people on the page and of course with the events in Tunis and following by, followed by the events that started to escalate in Cairo and Egypt the the Facebook page became more and more and more um, uh, you know a kind of catalyzer of something that was about to happen so I think that's the real role of that page. Mm -hmm. Now that page was essentially addressed to people who are in the in the age range, range uh, of age of uh, Khalid, mm -hmm. so um, late twenties. Um, I don't know what's the percentage in America, but in Egypt um, there is sixty five percent of the population is below thirty years old. You know that's huge. We're a very young country. <laughs> There's lots of babies every day that are born. So it's like, you know, when you're talking somebody who's 27 being killed, you know, imagine the impact on the similar kind of people in the in the population. So so that, you know, that kind of, you know, that that kind of merging of moments, events, um, the fact that also it's a generation that, as you know better than I do, you know, lives on Internet and knows Internet since they were born. You know, there's a very, it was a very natural thing. So it just sort of like all these elements kind of contributed for something to, to happen, to happen. Um, so it reached more the, the youth. Um, uh, the, the authors that we had to read for today, they, they seem a bit skeptical about if the social media can really, like, were really motivating people, mobilizing people. Um, there's no doubt that they, they did, but how, what was the importance of it compared to ground level organization? Um, and so in the tweets on the street, uh, Gerbodo um, mentioned that it took a few months before the actually uh, the, uh, the Facebook RSVP translate into massive physical attendance in public spaces, and uh, also the, the escape of Ben Ali from Tunisia. 
Um, and he mentioned also that the Occupy Wall Street movement was not magically born out of a Twitter hashtag, but gained importance after a slow pro process of ground level organization. So it's a, I know it's a tough question, but do you think that the Egyptian revolution would have happened without the digital, <laughs> digital technologies, without social media, um, or maybe in a more easy way to answer, um, how important was the role of Facebook in, in recruiting participants and mobilizing people? bring them to Terrier Square? Um, I mean, when, the, when, when it happened, and this is why this image actually is very important, because suddenly there's like this young woman and she's in front of the police. And, you know, to see this in an Arab country was in itself an image that shocked people. You know, wow, all these women were at the front line of the revolution. I mean, they weren't just standing at the back. They were actually at the front. And so to see that and to, um, to see that generation kind of come out and not want a revolution, they didn't come out asking for a revolution, they actually came out asking for dignity. So please stop the, poli the police from uh, abusing us, because I mean, I don't want to get into details, but you know, most people have been abused by the police and sometimes sexually abused by the police. So there's a huge amount of torture that came out, like revelation about how many instruments were hidden into these caves of all these police stations. Um, the, the 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 context was that you know you you have to imagine um, the Khalid Said case leading to the Facebook page leading to bringing all this generation essentially that generation to the street on the 25th of January. Um, that was a very important moment, and yes, it came out of universities, it came out of a new generation that was kind of like, you know, why are these older people not doing anything? You know, what's wrong with them? And very quickly, when the whole thing turned into, very quickly, it became violent. So from the first night, the police attacked all these demonstrators, even though they were much less in number. But they waited, as they do, because they're cowards. Uh, they waited until everybody went home, and then they attacked when there was less people in the street. So that happens usually at midnight. So then the this, this two days that followed, there is more violence that takes place in the street. A few people get killed, the first martyrs of the revolution. And that sort of you know, stated a kind of enough. Now that's it. Those kids went to the street. We adults are actually cowards for not having done what they're doing. We've been waiting for 30 years to even have the guts to do that. And they killed people. And why? And it's enough. And so on that Friday, which was called the Day of Anger, uh, the whole population went out. Everybody went out. Every single person. And we're talking the day where there's no more internet, there's no more telephones, there's no more anything. So everybody went out. So yes, there was a trigger that was associated to Facebook and people called it the Facebook revolution because there was something really beautiful about it. There was people who were young, people who were courageous, people who died. There was a real desire for change. There was something very innocent and very, very, um, you know, uh, really that uh, very hopeful. And the shift happened very quickly when, you know, that whole population followed, but very quickly also turned into, you know, who's going to take uh, advantage of what's happening. So this kind of unfolds as the revolution unfolds, but the, 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 the role of the social media at the very beginning is really a kind of trigger and a sign that this need for change comes from this generation that wants to have a future. But then everybody else who is politicized and everybody else who is part of the society also has different uh, interest in things changing or not. And so then a lot of other things happen. And then the, the media, as we, as we know, also take on another role as everything changes every minute and then every day and then every week and then and so on and so forth. So, so, so yes, it's a very important role, but it's not... You know, it doesn't define the society mm -hmm. because it's the trigger of something at the, at the beginning. And also it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't really, you know, what is not addressed also at, in that image of kind of utopic image of watching all these young people into, you know, walking towards something they're dreaming of. 
is that um, most of the population, especially people who are in the, the countryside, which has been very ignored during the revolution, especially by the foreign media, is like, oh, everybody was focusing on Tahrir. And Tahrir is just a little area in Cairo. It's actually not even that big. And, um, and yet, you know, there's Egypt. And Egypt is essentially countryside and, uh, and people who are peasants or people who are workers in the Delta. So all these people are not necessarily connected to internet. They don't have a Facebook page. So two million people signed up on Facebook in the first like 10, 20 days of when the internet came back. So I'm one of them. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, so, so, so then you have also this whole relationship of how people have focused on that first moment and it kind of colored what happened after. Uh, but no, it's much more complex than this. Yeah. Um, the economics of the country is at core of, you know, of the movement. The the the, the different uh, religions are at core in the movement. I mean, there's a lot of other levels that you know that we can get into, but it's mm -hmm. not the subject today. Yeah, uh, considering the the low level of internet connection in Egypt, so there was 25 percent of the population connected in 2011, according to the statistic that I saw. Uh, and the low alphabetization rate, 65% uh, compared to 99 in the states. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that only... So you found that number? Uh, yeah, but you know... That's huge, that's amazing. Well, alphabetization is something subjective. So I'm pretty sure it's not 99% or read very well. But, but 99 anyway. is not bad. I mean, <laughs> I yeah, I mean, um, so it was the one beside the, the 65%. Mm -hmm. um, and only 4% percent of adults were on Facebook before the revolution, so it's not much. Um, the question is, how did the techno-savvy youth manage to bridge the digital gap, the digital divide during the Arab Spring, and uh, were they employing other techniques, other means to, to kind of get these people who are not connected on the street? I think that's part of the problem, is that... Um, not, I mean, I wouldn't associate that problem to necessarily, you know, people were using the tools they have, but it, it very quickly kind of appeared that, you know, you have communities. It's, it's, it's a little bit like being in a university. So you have your group of people, you have your community, you have those you have you do sports with, you have those you have the same classes with, and so on and so forth. And And in a way, they start talking to each other, but they're not really talking to everybody else. And so suddenly when you start, anyway, I got on Twitter on uh, um, very early on as soon as the, the internet came back because I didn't have a television. I had to know what the hell is going on. So I tried to figure it out. I didn't really like Facebook, but I was like, wow, Twitter is pretty cool. So I really got it very quickly and I got like really agitated on Twitter very quickly. And so I'm like, okay, who's important? Who's saying what? So you start following people and understanding and kind of mapping who's the activists here and who's interesting and who's saying stupid things and who's saying interesting things and who's calling for violence, who's not. And so it's actually quite funny because it's like this whole thing is unfolding and you have like all these characters without face that, you know, are like that you discover and you become part of that whole, you know, that whole film in a way. And uh, um, the interesting thing was that, you know, some of those characters or activists or participants were um, really kind of focusing on this, this, you know, this notion of um, organization or this notion of um, uh, criticizing or freely talking because now we could talk. But there was no sense of you know, I never felt that they were talking to me. They were always kind of talking to one another, like knowing who was on Twitter, and they were like kind of talking to each other. And then the media, after the 18 days that toppled the, the Mubarak, the media, the international media, was much more present and able to document the revolution. And of course, the first thing they did is they made, they transformed people into heroes and icons of the revolution. And yes, some of them were, I mean, some of the, those people were amazing. Uh, and they st they're still amazing. But what it did is that it kind of, it kind of intensified the, the sort of, um, the ego of some of these people, and it intensified their importance in a movement and kind of blurred the actual reasons why all this was happening and kind of almost disconnected them from the rest of the society 
and one of the big criticism of that generation, whether it was in Alex, in Suez, or in Cairo, it doesn't matter, was that you know nobody was addressing the countryside, nobody was addressing the governorates around Cairo, nobody was addressing the actual role of all these people outside of the Tahrir, even like go down the street and go to another area and see what's going on. So, so this became really problematic because the way the focus became so about you know the square and so much about some of these important activists, it also created a kind of disconnection with the rest of the communities. And as young people are, you know, they're very passionate and they're very radical, and sometimes a little bit blinded by that passion, so they tend to kind of obscure themselves from the possibilities that, you know, to be strong, they need to have people on their side. And I think one of the big mistakes was that they were so, so radical and believed so much in a certain way for, the, that for democracy to be implemented that anybody who didn't believe the same thing, they kind of dismissed them. What they forgot to do is that they didn't realize that who they were dismissing were actually the majority of people in Egypt. And so to lose the majority of people in Egypt is also what got us to where we are today. And that majority said enough of this like bullshit or you know mess in the street that's happening and let's go back with at least having our military regime taking care of security right so so that was a i think that was one of the big mistakes is that you know you throw yourself into a movement but then you forget to bring people in with you do you think i i read that there were some tactics to kind of agitate people when, with face-to-face -face relation, like people were going in the street and were, uh, they, there was, there were some rallyment point at different places in like working neighborhoods and that people were, they were meeting there and then they were going down the street chanting slogans, positive slogans to kind of drive pe more people with them walking towards Tavir Square. Do you think that these kind of tactics are more efficient than the, the, the Facebook or the digital media tactics? Or it's kind of a combination of both that makes it more, that, that, that allow to reach more people, more, more diverse crowd? Um, I think it's all of, you know, it's everything together. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost like, a, it's something, you know, it's, you have to imagine it like something climaxing. And so you have you know, all these things happening, but you're not really aware maybe that they're happening, but suddenly everybody finds themselves in the same place and things collide. And it's that explosion that's actually incredible and that creates that, you know, that uh, that fascinating time that we that we lived. And so it's a combination, it's like, it's like a timing, you know, it's like a moment where everybody was ready. There's maybe some bars, I don't know, I mean, I don't know what, the, you know, who knows, but there was a real kind of an invisible march towards that time. And the tactics that were used were, of course, they started on Facebook. Said, Facebook, which, which I find out later, says, um, you know, prepares people for the 25th of January saying, you know, go down with onion, with an onion in your pocket, with a bottle of vinegar, and with um, a mask if you can. And so, you know, I found myself in Tahrir on the Friday, on Day of Anger at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. I didn't even know there was marches going from these mosques and all this. And I just real, I just knew everybody was going to meet in Tahrir, but I didn't realize there was a kind of movement that was going to actually take place. So I go before everybody very early, um, which means that I find myself in the center of the city, where then a few hours later, there's already demonstrations, so people are marching up and down the streets, and there's already these groups of people like kind of occupying the main streets of the, the area around Tahrir. And there's police kind of blocking the entrance to Tahrir from the outskirts of the city, of the center of the city. And all these marches kind of come towards the center, and of course confront the police. But I'm also inside, so I'm confronting the police from inside, it's like a big mess. Um, <laughs> And, you know, you have like this, it's really funny, because like suddenly I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then, boom, you know, tear gas. It's horrible. I don't know if you've experienced it before, but you start like really coughing and like everything hurts and it's really, 
itchy and so on and 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 some guy next to you will give you vinegar and wash you wash your face with vinegar and so it's all these tactics that were shared on the Facebook page but then when you're in the street you're dealing with the street I mean, you have to react quickly and you have to hide when you have to hide and you have to sort of you know you have to to, to, to understand violence like, very quickly and understand you know where you stand in all of this so it's it's a it's a mix of um, always adapting and having people with you that everybody supports each other so there's a real solidarity that's very natural that takes place because when you have a very clear enemy it's very easy to be friends with your neighbor when you're not sure who the enemy is then everybody's your enemy in a way so so it's a it's a very interesting time because you know it's very clear who the enemy is and so the so the energy and the kind of uh, togetherness is incredibly strong um, and so and so methods of you know of of responding to the very fast changing times that we're living in those 18 days and then a bit slower as time goes in the aftermath of tahrir is all about people finding solutions to everything and those solutions are shared on twitter they're in the street they're you know and maybe you can show also i don't know where it is in the in the slideshow but the way tahrir thing a photo of uh, yes. yes here the camp. Um, can you do it to slideshow? Um, so this is an image of uh, of uh, Tahdeis and how it was organized. And so at the center of it, in this under the tent, you have the blogger tent, the media tent. Um, then you have an area where you have the medical part where people who were hurt were being helped by whoever is a doctor was actually suddenly improvised themselves as you know making a hospital and a, and a space in the square where people could be taken care of on Twitter you would have suddenly like hashtags of you know medical supplies and uh, Tahrir squared uh, different types of names and and um, and people improvising accounts, but also organizing in little groups and saying, you know, if you're going to bring something, bring it like, let's, let's focus, you know, not everybody brings the uh, band-aids, you know, like if you want to bring something, this is what we need, this is what we need, and this is what we need, and this is where we are. And so you can like start helping people by following what's going on. So it's a combination of um, street intelligence and communication online and communication you know, between people. So it's a, it's a very fast-moving time and, and, and very fascinating because it really yeah. plays out on so many it's, layers. There are, there's kind of an interaction between organizing on the ground and organizing in the, the social media. Um, I want to switch subject and talk a bit about the, the role of social media for bringing the attention, the world attention to the cause. Um, there's no doubt that Facebook, YouTube, Flickr, Twitter uh, facilitated the citizen journalism, <clears throat> help disseminating the news, showing the police brutality to the world, um, eliciting uh, international attention. And similarly, the activists involved in the Occupy movement creatively use social media and cutting edge technology like live streaming to kind of bring the world attention to the encampment and to, uh, to the cause itself. Um, and both movements really uh, managed to secure an impressive degree of public support. Um, in your article, When Seeing is Belonging, I'm referring to it a lot, I really liked it, uh, you mentioned that the images of Terrace Square um, circulating on the web and in the news, and I quote, turn all, uh, turn all established cliches of Egypt on their heads. And I really like this uh, idea, and I would like to ask you how exactly did these images change the world perception of Egypt? So it, it feels so old already, and uh, sadly so, because of what's happening now with ISIS and all this horrible stuff. But um, at the time, if you remember, okay, 2011, this is like 10 years after 9-11, and there's been this whole war on terror and this whole, really, I mean, it's not new from 9-11, but it's, it's multiplied and it's expo it grew exponentially after 9-11, that whole, you know, that whole vision of the Arab world and and, you know, and putting everybody into, you know, an Arab is a Muslim, a Muslim is a terrorist. And it's like this kind of like generalization of, of what the Arab is, of what the Arab world is. So one of the cliches was very, you know, I, I should have put this picture, but uh, it doesn't matter. But um, 
you know, one of the first things that kind of comes up is suddenly the dirty Arab, the terrorist, is not a terrorist anymore. He's actually a revolutionary and he's working for peace in the world and he wants change and he wakes everybody up. You know, the whole world was stuck to their television looking at Tahrir. It was one of the most in the and it still is until today. So, you know, that was one thing. Then, if you remember, there was the Wisconsin actually happened more at the same time as Tahrir. And one of the funniest images that came out was this woman holding a banner saying, Egypt, help us. So, you know, from America being very kind of anti-Arabs and anti-terrorists and anti, you know, anti, anti, uh, anything that comes out of the Arab world, you have suddenly this kind of like calling for help from, you know, we actually are friends and we think the same way and we discover that maybe we can get along. So this was really interesting. And of course, to go back to photography and to my interest as an artist and the medium that I use and making images, you know, the what happens, or not so much in the 18 days as much as just after the 18 days, and if, you know, and the whole period, the aftermath after the, the Mubarak is toppled, is also to watch how, you know, I've experienced Egypt all my life as a kid and all my life as an adult to, you know, with this relationship it has with the West and with tourism and how Egypt has always been a place where, you know, I'm sure all of you have studied uh, ancient Egypt when you were 11 years old, more or less. So that's like in every school book in the world, you have ancient Egypt more or less at the age of 9 or 11, something like this. So it's the first fascination with, with the world and it's the first civilization and everybody wants to see the pyramids. But here we go, we're like, we have Tahrir and this pyramids, which here is not a cliche, it's actually another way of looking at the pyramid, which itself takes away the cliche of the idea that these pyramids are like unattainable, um, gets replaced by the bird's eye view of Tahrir. And after the 18 days, you start watching all these Western people that come and uh, do tourism in Tahrir. And, you know, want to see the revolution, want to be part of it. So you have people who are activists, you have people who are just, you know, people who are fascinated by what's happening. They want to be part of it. They just come. And so you see this new kind of tourism evolve and Egypt becoming associated with the revolution, Tahrir, people, etc., etc. And no one's talking about the pyramids. I'm not even sure I'm going to, even going to see them. <laughs> and I'm not sure how long that's going to take for them to kind of come back. But it's really, I think it's a very interesting sort of shift and how, you know, overnight that image that's been there for centuries gets kind of deleted, you know, and replaced by this other Egypt that yeah. we're in the middle of at the moment. I will definitely visit Terror Square if I go. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be sadly disappointed, but, you know, I can still take you to the pyramids. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of social media as an alternative to, um, to commercial media. Uh -huh. um, earlier in the semester, we saw that uh, we learned that few mega companies own the majority of the world's media outlets. And with uh, Armin and Chomsky... Uh, we saw that this was a problem, like a threat to democracy, because the mass media tend to construct a worldview that conforms to the need of corporate advertisement, uh, valorizing some political perspective and marginalizing other perspectives. Uh, and uh, in this context, a lot of people see Internet as a space where counter-hegemonic point of view can be expressed. And in countries like Egypt, the situation is even worse, since the media are controlled by the government, and subjected to censorship. Actually, that's more question than an affirmation. How biased was the Egyptian coverage of the revolution? And to what extent the, these, all these events happening were censored by the regime in, in the mass media in Egypt? Um, I want to maybe answer this and look a little bit. Can we come out of the, of the slide just so we see a little bit what we have? So, yeah, well, so... Afish, no, right. Al um, so yeah, it's a joke. It's uh, propaganda, but uh, old style. You know, it's 
like grotesque, you know, grotesque, you know that word? <laughs> so it's really like ridiculously, uh, um, it's, it's one big lie. And it's almost, I mean, it's sadly almost funny. I mean, it's dark, it's, it's dark humor at that point. But, uh, and, and when the revolution starts, nothing really changed. I mean, actually people who did not want to continue to participate to that lie left their jobs at the, um, the state media. And the state media continues to have a huge amount of power because of what I was saying earlier is that most people actually don't have internet. I mean, a lot of people do, but a lot of people still don't. And a lot of people believe in their army. I mean, why we're in, back in the military regime is because Egypt has a relationship that's a little bit incestuous with their army. You know, we have, a, we have an army that is not really that interested in keeping the country protected from potential external enemies as much as we have an army that is, to, is there to control us. But that army is made of us. So every single family in Egypt has at least two or three people that are in the army. So, you know, nobody wants their army to be at war either with them or with anybody else because that would mean their son, their father, their brother could be in danger. However, the army and the regime controlled the media. And so at one point in the evolution of the events and the continuation of the role of the army post Mubarak being toppled, so we have we go from Mubarak to having the the rule of the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, which is the army. Um, we have uh, a whole series of, uh, of events that take place. And one of them is um, a very terrible massacre that happens in October 2011 in front of the state media, uh, Maspero, this huge building that is uh, on the Nile in Cairo, where uh, the media is broadcasted. And uh, there's a demonstration uh, because a lot of, at the time, a lot of Christian churches are being attacked. This is a period for months and months and months where we don't have police in the country, in the city, and nowhere. So we were very happy, actually, but there was still a lot of little crime, given that um, there is no police. So, of course, there is going to be crime. But um, uh, these crimes happening in Upper Egypt lead to these demonstrations to ask for the Supreme Council of Armed Forces to protect the Christians in Egypt who are a minority. That, that uh, demonstration leads to the army actually rolling over people. And, you know, the whole thing is atrocious. And people get rolled over the photos, I can't even tell you the horrible photos that circulate on, the, on, the, on Facebook and whatever. Um, lots of people died. It was really, really ugly. And of course, the army goes and says, goes on TV and says, oh, but we don't use live ammunition. We don't actually use live ammunition. We didn't do anything. Um, and so this graffiti says, Kazibun, liars. And it has the, the you know, the, the army... Uh, uh, of the army cap. So Kazibun becomes a movement where people do sort of video flash mobs in the street projecting uh, videos of martyrs and others at very impromptu moments in the street saying, you know, the army is lying to you. And this is like in a, in a popular area of Cairo. And what about the American media? Because we, we saw in the course that the American media tend to be very biased when, especially when they cover international politics. And we know that the states were supporting the Mubarak regime to a certain extent before the revolution. So were the American media also biased, very biased? Or are they more, more fair during the revolution? I don't know if Ar Arte is, uh, what Arte is, this one. Do you know what this, this channel is? Anybody I'm not sure where is it from, but it's Russia. It Russia. is right. So this is quite funny because I, you know, with with your text. Let's talk about the role of social media in organizing the protests. 
Uh, so we often refer to, uh, the, the, the scholars often refer to social media as a means to coordinate gatherings, road blockage, protests, other forms of actions on the ground during the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement. Apparently, Facebook was used to set the date of events, Twitter was used to connect people uh, across distance and to share logistics in real time. As you said earlier, you have to react quickly on the ground, so sometimes Twitter was saying, oh, th this is the rallying point, this is the location where the police is, this is the, the things we need, the medicine we need for because mm -hmm. there were uh, people uh, injured. Uh, and uh, Gerbodo uses the expression choreography of assembly to describe this the role of social media in facilitating the, the physical assembling of highly dispersed individual and as, as well as the scene setting and scripting. Um, so um, how did you use yourself as a social media as a mean to organize your, your, your day, your, where you're going to go, what you're going to do during the revolution? I mean, I wasn't, I, you know, again, I wasn't a Facebook, Twitter person, so I was using it more to kind of know what was going on and to make sure uh, I wouldn't miss something kind of, you know, dangerous or, you know, something I should know about. Mm -hmm. So it was very, um, you know, and I and actually for a little while, I always felt a little bit late. Like, I always felt like I'm not really sure what's going on here. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to make sense of it. and. In retrospect, talking to people, everybody was in that same situation because no one really was expecting this to happen. So everyone was trying to figure out who was who in all of this. You know, who's doing this actually? Who is there? Somebody doing this, or is this where is this coming from? So there was a a sense of uh, first understanding minute by minute where you where you stand because this is also where I live. You know, this is my life. So for four years, I lived in the middle of. You know, I mean, one night I, you know, one day I, I uh, um, yeah, I don't know what time it was. It was like maybe 11 p.m. or something. And I live, uh, the Nile is not so far from me. And on the other side of the Nile is a whole area that is called Imbaba. And it's a popular area. And it's very, very, you know, very, very populated. And I mean, Cairo is 20 million people. So it's a very, very dense population and dense city. And I live in an area where there's a lot of embassies and schools and it's between two branches of the Nile. And so on one side is Tahrir and on the other side is other areas of Cairo. So I could walk to Tahrir, but at the same time I was across the Nile. So there was a sense of uh, also a feeling of security. People actually moved back to where I live because it was almost the safest place to be in Cairo in that period. But, you know, all of a sudden at 11 p.m., you know, I get up and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And I look down at every window from my, my house and it's I've never seen this. Like all these tanks are just, you know, driving super fast in every street and like heading towards this area. And I mean, this is this this was never seen. You never saw this or wake up in the morning and go to my kitchen and I'm about to go to Tahrir and it's really early and we're still in the 18 days and I look out my <laughs> I look at my window and I'm like what's going on here and I see the building across the Nile that is burning and so this whole area is burning and that was the day of anger also the following days after the day of anger everything had been looted and so on so it was constantly like negotiating you know the, the, the danger zones, the moments where you should be in the street, the moments where you shouldn't, uh, what you're ready to go through or not. And, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily ready to, uh, to get killed. It wasn't really, I don't think it was a smart thing to do. So, um, so for me, um, Twitter, much more than Facebook, was really a way of making sure I would know what the kind of tension, where we were at in the tension mm -hmm. scale. And so it was really interesting because I was always in the square, but I also always was aware that, oh, the army's coming in half an hour. We're going to get into a battle. Tonight there's going to be a massacre. And, and this would happen. So, you know, before this would happen, I would just go home and say, you know, I'm not going to get into this. So, so it was really interesting to watch also that movement online. But it was also very confusing because some people were also acting from... Um, the spare of the moment and a bit of hysteria and so not everything was real and not everything was true 
that was being spread on social media. So it's this whole constant kind of figuring out what is real, what is not, is it really happening, you know, who's there, someone you trust, try to get somebody on Twitter that you think will not be talking bullshit. And then you have also groups that form themselves according to how the events unfold. And so some of them um, are focusing on giving you the right news. Some of them are focusing on giving you uh, information about what medical supplies are needed. Some of them are organized, and this was really incredible, much later in the game. We had a huge amount of sexual harassment in Tahrir. So you have this amazing crowd, especially of women that got together, and young women that got together to organize bodyguards. You know, and people who would help people go through the square without being sexually harassed. Of course, they got sexually harassed themselves following that. So it was pretty crazy. But you had this amazing amount of energy of people really putting themselves together and, uh, you know, coming in groups and creating a different um, support system. So this was really fascinating and how people used social media in that way was really, you know, really beautiful. The author that we had to read for today, the... They seem to be convinced that the most successful movements <clears throat> are always driven by face-to-face -face relation, underground organization, not only by social media. Um, and moreover, they would go as far as saying that when we put all our energy on building websites, innovative software, technological infrastructure, uh, we're taking away the focus from building more movement and alliance on the ground and connecting, like making real relationship with local communities, <clears throat> it, it may be more accurate for the uh, Occupy movement. Um, and th this also this idea that the virtual proximity that we can experiment online doesn't compare to the, the community feeling, the body density, Uh, of the, the protest camps where like people eat, sleep together, defend their territories together, so these this proximities uh, of the bodies. Um, I don't know how you feel about this. Uh, do you think it's important to keep this this face-to-face -face interaction and physically occupy uh, a, a space during a revolution or a revolution <laughs> can only happen online? <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm not a specialist in organizing revolutions, but... Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, you maybe, know, maybe you a know. more easy question for you because it's kind of abstract, but did at some point in the revolution, Tahrir became a, a kind of a coordination platform more than social media, meaning like you could get information mm -hmm. on the ground? No, no, of course. I mean, it was very different what happened on the ground and what you could, you know, depending on, you know, I mean, if you were somebody on Twitter since two or three years, I think you would probably have a much more understandable kind of uh, map of uh, actions, events, and and you would probably have been aware of the Facebook page of Khalid Saeed and so on much more before all of this would start. So if you're part of that generation or a journalist again, who we were the main two categories of people that use Twitter, for example, uh, I'll leave Facebook out for a while. Um, You know, you would you would be really aware of you know which kind of people have an interesting perception of the events and and how to negotiate that, and then on the ground you would be therefore definitely magnetized or attracted by different uh, areas in the square and where people were organized or understand better the kind of actual mapping on the ground of the picture I showed you where you could see the bloggers and and all of this. Um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it was kind of weird because I I lost my phone. Very, <laughs> Not only there was no internet, but I also lost my phone like two, three days after all the, the whole thing started. And of course, every shop was closed, so I couldn't get a new phone for a few days. So I really wanted a phone just to call my mother in Lebanon and just make sure she wouldn't worry. But I was completely disconnected from my normal daily life. And... Um, I ended up being much more connected to people on the street and knowing people on the street and figuring out what's, you know, how the square is organized and participate to that. 
Um, I think your question can be answered by yes and no, because we're talking 18 days where something very specific, where people really, you know, really conglomerated to Tahrir and in Alex and every other city. We're always talking about Tahrir, but there is the rest of Egypt. But something, again, in that period, you have a very clear enemy and you have a very clear goal. But then afterwards, it's a very different situation. And so the negotiations that happen on the street or online are a very different kind of, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they become very different in terms of the dynamics and how they influence what happens. So there was periods where um, Facebook and Twitter were at the front of what you needed to look at to really know what was happening. So I would say this was for sure the case during the 18 days. At a later stage, there was much more um, focus between foreign media, local media, and social media. So it was really covered by everybody and everything. And that was a, like a total concentration of media on, from all directions. And less action on the streets because the, the sit-in finished. But people, some people stayed, but not the majority. And then you have other waves where there's much more analysis going on where the politics on the ground are not as violent or not as regularly violent or not as regularly intense. But what happens online is extraordinary. And you have like 100 people talking every day, writing blogs and so on. Plus, television becomes occupied by talking heads. And it's talking heads, talking heads. There were two years of talking heads of, you know, people finally talking. And so it's analysis. So what's going on? What do you think is going on? What do you think is going to happen? What do you think of these guys? What do you think of the Muslim Brotherhood? What do you think of the army? And we could say anything we wanted. We just didn't realize we wouldn't have that much time to continue to do so. But, you know, it was quite an extraordinary period. And, and so, the, again, it's this kind of power of what has more power at a different moment than another moment. And so it's also, again, a kind of balance between you know, how social media is influential or how, or how media is or how being on the <coughs> ground is. And there was a very clear moment where people said, you know, it doesn't do anything to go to Tahrir anymore. You know, we have to get back home and we have to do the real work. And the real work is change very fundamental aspects and values within society. It's not going to the street and rebelling. Rebelling is important, but then you have to follow up. And follow-up means you have to educate people, you have to work with them, you have to get involved in your communities. You have to act directly with people that are your neighbors. And that can take 10 years, 20 years. And not everybody wants to spend that kind of time doing that. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, another subject. But that's the, <coughs> the kind of landscape. I want to make sure we have time to talk about your current work so we can go more quickly on the next questions. Um, in the book, uh, we had to read the digital rebellion. Um, there's the one problematic aspect of the contemporary activism that was underlined is the difficulty to connect with local struggle, local communities, people from the working class. So we said this before, but also uh, the fact that these movements are using the, the new technologies and internet so much that it tends to favor the leadership of white male college educated activists at the expense of uh, homeless people, unemployed women, people of color, indigenous. Um, was it also the case in Egypt? How diversified was, was the crowd on, on Tahrir Square? Were, were, they, were there like people from very different background, women and men, or they were more favoring men? And, and so in the 18 days, it was a very different, you know, everybody remembered the 18 days as something unique, and then there's the rest. But during the 18 days, of course, it's, it was mainly occupied by um, all these young people that were on Facebook and did this Khalid Said page and so on, and who were coming out of universities and so on. But there was also a majority of population from every kind of, you know, you know every, every city, every... Uh, uh, every area of Cairo, uh, from Alex, I mean, people, you know, were very diverse, the people who, who were in the square. But there was a kind of attitude that was very particular during those 18 days. And again, I, had, I think it has to do with the clarity of who you're fighting. And so nobody complained of sexual harassment in those 18 days. Mm -hmm. wow. um, 
although I think I'm sure there was. But I mean, it wasn't like, you know, there was something that held people together because it was, it was so dramatic. And it was so, you know, we were, you know, we didn't know what's going to happen. And, and we knew that if this fails, we'll all end up in jail. So it couldn't fail. That's too late. We're, we've gone already too far. And actually, everybody's in jail now. Like, most of the people who are really, really at the front of, you know, like, obvious activists are, for a lot of them, either in jail or not even, you know, there's thousands of people that have been arrested. So and the others have left the country because they've been threatened to be arrested. So you have a real um, uh, sort of, you know, what do you call it, like an escape of intellect as, as it happens in those in those situations but the, the 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 general sense is that in the 18 days you have a very clear objective and everybody's together in that towards that objective so nobody hurts anybody and time hasn't come yet to divide people and so it's much later after Mubarak is toppled that suddenly everybody's like okay so who's gonna be in power now so, oh, I want the power. No, I want the power. No, I want the power. So there's this kind of, now society gets divided and people remove their masks. 30 years, maybe maybe actually 60 years, where the guy who sells the tomatoes downstairs or the man who you buy your bread from, you don't know what he thinks. You don't know who he is. I mean, you know he's Muslim or you know he's maybe a little bit conservative, but you're not sure of, you don't care even what he is. I mean, personally, I don't care. But suddenly, after the 18 days, I know this guy is a Salafi and then this guy is a Muslim Brotherhood. This guy is like against this or that. You know, I mean, everybody becomes who they really are and they're not afraid of showing who they really are. So the beards grew. <laughs> also the young people like you started to have beards and I was like why is everybody growing a beard and I started asking everybody is like okay I get it that Muslim Brotherhood will have their beards because they've been like arrested for the last 30 years and they've been in jail for the last 30 years so but why you my friend why I know you're not a brotherhood so why are you growing your beard like what's going what's up with this bloody fashion <laughs> And they're like, well, you know, when you're young and you're like in your early 20s, 30s, the police arrest you systematically if you're a man and you have a little bit of a, you know, of a beard. And so actually every young guy in the street let their beards grow because finally they were like not harassed by the police for being maybe a brotherhood or maybe not, you know. So it was really interesting to watch this happen. And, and of course, when the when the military came back after the Brotherhood took power and so on, it was like this joke on Facebook, which was, you know, the, the Beak, the company Beak that sells razors is going to make a fortune because everybody's going to have to shave it down, which is, which is what happened. Nobody has a beard now. It's like, you don't want to have a beard right now. <laughs> it's like a, not a good place for that. Um, I want to talk a bit about the role of social media as an <clears throat> emotional conduit. I think you had a video about that somewhere. Um, so uh, it's clear that social media cannot be reduced to a purely instrumental tool for mobilization and tactical coordination. They also participate, as Gerbodo says in his text, to a symbolic construction of a collective identity, a sense of togetherness, as you said earlier, uh, among activists, physical occupiers, and internet users. And uh, this is uh, kind of clear with the page of uh, We Are All Khaled Said but uh, also with, uh, if I can find it, the tumble page, uh, the tumble blog page of, um, ah, it's here, of uh, Occupy movement uh, that was kind of collecting different testimonies uh, of people who consider themselves as the 90%, 99%, uh, kind of as a rallying point for the construction of an inclusive popular identity. And this movement was really appealing to everybody. Um, so uh, do you think that uh, social networks serve as an emotional conduit that condense sentiment of in indignation, anger, pride, victimhood? Um, do you have other example that the Facebook page, we are all Khaled Said, you had a video or uh, maybe um, show about that? This one? Oh, you show it. we show it already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was with the army. Um, but did you feel that it, then the Facebook page was really canalizing 
feelings and generating. I mean, I mean, we're in a world that is not just the generation of 25 years old, but we're in a world where we all use internet and we all use our computers. We all use social media. We, you know, I mean, the majority of people does, and uh, and so um, the the and and we are also at a time when. After, again, I repeat, after 30 or maybe 60 years even of a military regime, you have a little bracket of time where everybody's allowed to talk. And so imagine the, 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 the avalanche of information that we get. Yeah. So from, from not being able to do anything, talk, take photos in the streets without being harassed by some kind of policeman that is in civil closed or by a sign that says do not take photos here because it's a military base because Egypt is owned by the military so I mean every street is military base really you have from that situation you have a complete shift overnight to everybody can say who they are everybody can say what they think and so everybody does and in fact it was pretty amazing and magical and very creative it was a very very creative period where People were allowed to be the best of themselves, and they were. And so the random citizen became a, the biggest artist. You know, suddenly overnight you had this amazing video, very funny or maybe very powerful or very emotional or very poignant that would be posted on the net or on Twitter or whatever and would communicate something. And people, again, created not just on not with a hashtag or not just with a Facebook page, but they created communities. And so you have thousands of websites that were born from the merging of people to collect. So for example, you have, um, this can kind of go into the work I'm doing now, but you had uh, suddenly like a group that organized to collect all the papers, pamphlets, messages that were circulating every day in Tahrir according to what was happening. And it was like, this is in itself an extraordinary amount of documents. And so they would pick these documents and scan them and put them on the net. And so this is a, a website called Tahrir Documents, where you can go and you can see, according to the date, what was being circulating, what was available in the square, what people were giving each other, handing out. Um, you have communities that, so you have like a great community, you know, a, m a number of community that, that, uh, communities that have archived different aspects of the revolution. You have people who have uh, created, uh, of course, a lot of music came out of the revolution. This was one of the biggest um, outcome of the first couple of months. Um, you really had like a huge amount of creativity. And in a way, this is what I was telling you, it's a, it's a kind of, um, uh, you know, the difference between uh, activists, artists, activism, also people doing art, but in an activist kind of way, and not necessarily in a kind of contemporary art kind of way. So it's more something that is using creativity as a tool, but as a tool to fight back, to answer something that is happening. So, so there was a whole lot of expression and ways of expressing oneself that were was born from the the, the, the first few months of the revolution. I'm not sure I'm answering you, but I think yeah, this is I just a, I don't want to go you know, too far in what we're going to talk later about your work and everything. So let me just ask you uh, this question about uh, the logic of orient uh, horizontalism of the cyber left movement, uh, because all these new uh, activist movements like Occupy, Anonymous, Arab Spring, and even indie media before, they claim to be um, a movement, they present themselves as a direct participatory democracy with a preference for horizontal structure instead of vertical. So basically they say they don't, they don't have any leaders, they don't do elections, uh, everybody's a leader kind of. Um, and uh, then the authors of the text that we had to read for today, they claim that these movements were not as leaderless, uh, as flat as they claim. And I'm, I'm curious to know um, if, if it's the same feeling that you have. Uh, Gerbaudot used the concept of choreographer to describe a kind of a soft form of leadership that took place during these movements. Uh, people who kind of are Facebook, Facebook admin, tweets or bloggers, and we set the stage, but without being in the forefront. Um, 
people who orchestrate the, uh, for example, the uh, the Occupy uh, uh, Wall Street uh, advertising campaign that was really carefully organized. So you see that it's uh, there are some brain emerging in in these movements. Um, do you have any example of soft leader that was that were organizing the stage? I know that there, are, there were some bloggers that were maybe influ having a bigger influence. I mean, there's a whole uh, culture of um, of bloggers that was born in the Middle East. Uh, I think very much after the 2006 war in Lebanon and the influence of how people used the internet at the time. And so they created a kind of community across the, the region, not just in Egypt. And so, of course, there's some very influential people on um, online. Uh, Hamalawi is one of them because he he uh, he's the one who um, he's a trustist trustist uh, activist who is also a photographer and he documented 6 of April uh, 2008. Uh, Mahala uh, demonstrations that I was describing earlier, uh, which then led to the group that uh, became opposing opposing the power, the sixth six of April movement. So Hamalawi, for example, was uh, documenting already in 2008 those movements because he works a lot with workers in Egypt, and he uh, he blogged already three years before the revolution that the revolution will be flickerized. Mm -hmm. And um, his statement was that if we take photos and if we manage to document what we are actually what is actually happening and posting it and making people see what is happening, then there will be a movement that will come out of it. Um, and again this was countering the media propaganda which was not showing any of this stuff. We all knew it, but not really, but kind of. So, um, so of course, there was very important uh, people who were doing the work already. It's not like it happened overnight. Mm -hmm. um, but they were not, they were activists. They were not trying to take power. Yeah. And a lot of them didn't know how to take power. And it's not what they do. Some of them became micro-celebrities against their own will, right? Did they yeah, I mean, they were happy to be. Like, nobody... <laughs> no, no, no one... No one, they're they're trying trying refuse, modest, no one <laughs> refuses to be a celebrity, I think. I mean, it's kind of a, a human thing. But but, yeah. but, but, but but these people are not... Because they're activists, they're not politicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not because you're in the street that you're a revolutionary. It's not because you're an activist that you understand politics. It's not because you're an artist that you necess necessarily do good art. So, you know, it's, it's, these things are not simple and it's great to have a movement, but, you know, where it fails is that there is no uh, handing over that moment that we have a little bit of power, but it's very fragile and we don't, um, and we let go of, you know, that very fragile shift that can happen, and instead of giving the lead to someone who actually understands politics and is able to take over the role of a, party, a political party that could hold together a country like Egypt that has 90 million people, I mean, it's insane. You know, uh, uh, instead of that, you, you, you watch people disagreeing and ego fighting. You know, it's it's a and and something very important is that the nature of a revolution and the nature of dictatorship, so Egypt or anywhere in the world, is a dictatorship by nature is to dictate and to eliminate anybody opposing them. So there is no actual opposing power in place during a dictatorship, and that was true during Mubarak regime. So there was a political party called the Kefaya. Kefaya means enough. And they were like, oh, you know, they were really like fighting almost alone and always being put in jail and out and put in jail and out. And they were pretty upset because no one really talked about them when the revolution started, but they were the only ones really fighting the regime for the, the seven years that preceded the revolution. And then you had the 6th of April movement, which was relatively new, three years, but still not so public. And they were preparing a revolution for September 2011, 
because they had gone to, uh, I think, the Republic of Czech and kind of uh, been trained in different parts of the world where there had been uh, um, uh, peaceful revolutions that had actually succeeded. But that was a plan just before the, 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 the next election of where Mubarak was going to put his son in power. So when this happened, there was no plan. There was, it was, we didn't go to the streets saying we want a revolution. You know, there was no plan to hand the, the power over, to, to have somebody ready to take power if that would work. So would you say that? That's where the gap sort of, you know. Yeah, because the authors that we read are, they kind of argue that the, these leaderless movements, they don't allow to build, to make proactive decisions, build long-term powerful organization, and not investing in leadership will eventually lead to the, the dismantle of this, these movements. Yes. Uh, so do you, you think that happens. you think that the revolution would have benefited from having stronger leaders who take responsibility for 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 some failure or some? Yes, of course it would. But the problem was that uh, there was nobody. And uh, everybody who tried was rejected by everybody else, mm. and for many reasons. So even Baradai, who came back to Egypt three years before Mubarak left, um, was not liked by the Egyptian population because he's lived 20 years abroad, and also for a very good reason, which is he was one of the actors that had influenced the Gulf War, the Iraq War in 2003, by saying, by being the one who was appointed to give the answer on whether or not there was nuclear weapons in Iraq. And he said, yes, we never found any. But, you know, what the consequences of that is terrible. And so, of course, people don't forget that. So when he came and said, oh, I'm going to be the next president, of course, everybody said, excuse me, like, who are you? you know? <laughs> so, you know, and so that was the case for everybody who presented themselves as a leader. So even the brotherhood, even, you know, everybody who... who But, but who can be ready when there's a dictatorship that does not that puts people in jail if they say, I'm going to present myself at the next election? Mm. But next thing you know is they're arrested or they have to leave the country. So, so you know, there's no... Um, but that's the nature of a dictatorship. So you're surrounded by a wall. You need to break the wall. And you don't know what's behind the wall. And you're not ready to go behind the wall. But you have no other choice. That's the first step. You need to break that wall. So we broke the wall, we're back into another, <laughs> another <laughs> wall, but now we know what's going on, you know, and now we know what's going on and things will not be the way they were. It might take more time and it's a very different battle that will prepare itself, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a necessity to go through these steps. So we don't have much time left, uh, ideally 10 minutes. Um, That's okay. We talked to I mean, gonna, everybody had enough, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we want to talk about your current work because it's very interesting and the obsession of scholars for uh, the role played by Twitter and Facebook during the revolution kind of eclipsed a very interesting conversation that we can have about the role of traditional media uh, in the, the revolution. And since you're the co-founder of uh, a radio and a cinema uh, <laughs> during the revolution, I think you're the best person to talk about this. So can you talk a little that's bit about... A, that's traditional media? Yes, Sorry, okay. cinema and radio okay, are okay. traditional media uh, compared to digital media. So okay. can you talk briefly about these two um, initiatives before we talk about your project? Sure, Hong? sure, sure. I mean, um, so again, I'm an artist and when all this started, I watched all this amazing stuff come out of nowhere. Uh, by people producing music, uh, films, and so on. Um, and I watched one video that really fascinated me, uh, which triggered this kind of interest for what was happening every day and what I was experiencing was resonating with events that I remembered from my childhood, which I didn't live, but I remember watching on TV and being very impressed by. And so that first video of a truck um, and somebody standing in front of the police truck, the cannon, the water cannon, uh, but not going anywhere. He would just stay there. And so the police kind of backward, you know, goes backwards, which is incredible. And, and it's one of the first video of courage that 
appears and viral on YouTube. And people called it, it was posted on YouTube and it was called Cairo Tiananmen Courage video or something. Um, and so this connection with art, with the history, with another event from 89 in China of, if you remember this video, if you know this video of this man standing in front of, the, of an army camp uh, tank and not moving and the whole world watching 20 tanks kind of going towards this man, triggered the need for me to see and understand what was happening in relationship to history in the world, not just to Egypt and to Egyptian history. And so I started collecting things and archiving videos and, and or, you know, and just kind of learning and collecting and organizing and, and so on. And one of the first thing I did was, um, I didn't want to do any artwork. That was like not the time for me to do any artwork. But in the square, I met a lot of people. And with a friend of mine, during the 18 days, we wanted to do a free radio so that we could do like, um, you know, we could uh, connect ourselves. And the 18 days ended, Mubarak was toppled and so on, but we still wanted to do the radio. So suddenly it was not just my friend and I, it was actually like the guy next to me wants to do the radio and then he knows this guy who also wants to work with him and then this person is doing this and, and it was very organic and before I knew it we were a whole group of people and we recreated this radio. So it was a very uh, spontaneous and it was uh, a lot of, uh, it, there was one very funny show of two uh, characters uh, making fun of politics Um, and then there was a lot of music from the revolution, so we were kind of a, a kind of a receptacle for all this music production during those that period. Um, following that, well, that's another uh, image. Uh, following that, I, I uh, a few months later, I realized uh, that. Most people probably hadn't seen all these uh, animation videos like the one I showed you, that most people weren't on internet, that actually not everybody had seen what really happened in the 18 days. And we were again doing a sit-in in Tahrir. So I decided I have to use the archive that I started building and I have to show this to people. And there's a sit-in that's starting and I know it's going to take a long time and I'm not going to sit there in the square and not do anything and actually There's no images in the square, so we need to focus on something. People need to see something. So I decided to make a cinema, but I wasn't sure what and how and all of this. And then I'm on Twitter and I see somebody saying, oh, we should project films. I was like, oh, he's, you know, he wants to do that too, so I connected with him. And then somebody else said, oh, you want to do a cinema? I know your work. I've seen your work. I don't know what. Oh, are you going to show your work? I said, of course I'm not going to show my work. This is like the middle of a revolution. Who cares about seeing my work? But let's get together and talk about it. And so we created the cinema in the sit-in. And every night we projected um, material that was circulating, circulating on the internet. But that most probably most people didn't see. And it created a space for a platform for debating the revolution, a platform for uh, convening and sharing the archives. So people would come with their phone and say, can you give me a copy of what you show? Because I would... I can see, I can show this to my uh, in my area. You know, I can show this to the coffee uh, next door and project it in the street next to my house. I can show it to my family. I can bring it to my village, and I can give you what I filmed. And so it was a way of exchanging material and kind of disseminating also on the ground footage from the revolution that was counter countering the media propaganda that was happening. Um, so. These are some images of the crowds in the square watching the, the footage. For the last five minutes, let's talk about your project on the archiving the revolution because it's also a concern that we should have. We even had with popcorn. digital media. <laughs> um, um, and yeah, so and so these are the two projects that I've done. Um, as a first, you know, the first sort of actions or, or outcome of collecting material and, and, and feeling like to make sense of all this. I, and because of the collage that you saw originally, 
you can imagine how my head works and I have to have like lots of stuff and make connections and all this. So it doesn't happen immediately. It's like it takes a little bit of time to find these links. And same thing here is like I, I just felt there's no conclusion to be made now. But all these questions are popping every minute in my head. So my collection of archive was really about keeping this for when I'll be able to think about it. <laughs> And when there will be a moment where things start to kind of like come down and I can make sense of it and find the link that holds it all together. If there is one, I don't know. Um, and, so, um, and so now my project here is about looking at that period of two, three years um, and trying to build a timeline of the revolution that is interactive. Um, so this is an example of a very fantastic, beautiful uh, visual timeline of the history of the world, which is, uh, this part is about ancient Egypt, as you see the, the Sphinx and the pyramids. And I find it really fascinating because it has a color coding, it has images, it has text, it has a sense of continuity, it has layers. So things happen in one country, but you can start seeing also what was happening in parallel to Egypt, so the tsunami in Japan, Bin Laden arrested and killed, um, Occupy Wall Street, and all these resonating events between Tahrir and other countries in the world. Um, and at the same time being quite a personal view of it because it's a, it's a collection of elements that I'm interested in because of the nature of the work I do and the type of material I normally work with. And so I actually focused my archive on the again that production that creative production from the random citizen and what i call the popular language of tahrir um, so these are these are early sketches of my timeline made from uh, photos that i took videos that i collected etc uh, etc et this is a detail and then this is a um, um, uh, one of the graffitis from Mohammed Mahmoud Street. That's at that. It's one of the uh, areas that come out of Tahrir and where the street graffiti artists of the revolution have over and over and over again and overlaid all these fantastic paintings as things happened, portraits of martyrs and so on. Um, and that huge wall, continuous street, uh, is so extraordinary and constitutes a really uh, ongoing tableau vivant and uh, that mix between that kind of art in the street and that influence of that beautiful painting and the social media production that we experience is for me sort of like missing something that it needs to come together and so what I'm trying to do is a kind of painting of the 21st century but that is interactive so that is um, that you would be immersed in as an audience but also be able to kind of talk to and look at in a way that you would say, okay, I'm interested in, like, you know, your question is, you know, what is um, the role of the army or the social media in the revolution? And so you would only see suddenly the, the rest of the, 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 the timeline would sort of disappear and what, you come, what comes forward would be all the aspects and all the moments in which social media is actually mentioned in an article or is in a hashtag of one or another type of uh, media that is being... Uh, displayed. Well, I cannot wait to see it. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> um, um, is there questions on, like, specifically on the presentation? Because uh, we're going to have a discussion later on things that you posted on the forum, but is there any questions related to what we spoke about? Yeah, yeah there is um, kind of a piece which you said you built next to a real a military basement or something like that. Uh -huh. How did they let you do that? So um, the military base is a, is a huge area that is that, that was a little bit elitist. So poor people were very uh, were not very welcomed mm -hmm. and usually they tend to tended to be like kind of kicked out. Um, it's in the middle of it is the opera house. Uh, the library of music and uh, the pavilion of arts and all of this is managed by uh, the government the ministry of culture but the area and that whole space belongs to the military 
and there's a military uh, base just next to the opera so it's it's surrounded by security it's very well guarded and blah 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 and one of the events is funnily enough Egypt has one of the oldest biennial of contemporary art so it's almost as old as the Venice biennial that's very famous and so for 25 years there's been like every two years there's this event this art event which is a disaster and um, of horror it's like a horror show um, but uh, you know that uh, year 2008 December 2008 um, was one of the iterations of the biennial and for the first time in 25 years they changed the curators from the minister of culture to two young men that they appointed to be uh, taking care of that event and they asked me to be part of the event which was in itself crazy because I'm a woman, I'm of Lebanese origin, so I'm not a pure Egyptian. Um, I'm Christian, you know, I'm from the art world that is more private, not the government type uh, artists. So all of the things that normally they hate. And so, so it was like, wow, they're inviting me. Of course, I have to say yes, but I also have to make a point of my participation. I don't want to just show a collage or a piece that is an interesting piece, but not in this context. So I want to actually respond to where I'm going to show. So I wanted to do a work in situ. And so I talked to the, the curator and I told him, uh, that's my idea, I want to do this. And I was very lucky because he said, oh my God, I'm really interested in these areas. And he, because he was one of the first ones, I mean, the first one in 25 years to kind of something really radically happening, changing, in that structure of the biennial, of course he was happy to do something provocative and he wanted to do something provocative and he wanted his biennale to be successful and already to choose me was a problem. So, <laughs> so it was really funny. So of course he was totally on my side. And so I negotiated to have a piece of land and to occupy this little piece of land. That, you know, the, and then I had the gardener come and tell me, what are you doing to my flowers? And I don't know what, I was like, okay. I'll do them again, you know, like, just leave me work. So it was a very, very interesting yeah, for all these reasons, because everybody was waiting to see what's going to happen, what are, they, what are they actually going to show, you know, is it really going to make a difference? Um, and it was a fascinating, uh, very uh, exciting time, and the work was really very engaging, because the people who built the tower live in these areas, and when they understood what I was doing, they became completely in love with it, and then the people who guard that military base are people who live in these areas. So they actually came and did their naps. They took naps inside my tower. Um, the people who uh, own the cafes around the library and all of this inside the, the garden surrounding became familiar with me building this for two months and then showing it for another month. And so every time there was a visitor, they would come and offer coffee. So it became a coffee. I mean, it was incredible. And, you know, I would come in the morning and find, like, these huge ashtrays full of cigarettes. So I was like, who smoked all this? You know, I would ask the security guy, like, who smoked all this? He's like, well, the director of the opera house came with, like, his meeting, you know, with somebody he was meeting. And they stayed three hours and smoked, like, all night. And I'm like, okay, they were having their meetings in that space. So that space became, like, a space, you know. It was, like, super alive. And, uh, and it was really interesting because... They, it helped sort of, you know, the, the people came to me and said, you know, normally we see these areas are as crime-ridden, ugly, uh, horrible people. You know, they have very negative connotations. And now I'm going to go back to these areas and look at it from a different angle. So it was this kind of, you know, it was this kind of energy and, and, and trying to bring people to look at themselves from in a different way, you know, and, and see, okay, wake up, you know, that was, yeah, well, good. I wish we had more time to discuss, it's so interesting, all of this, but we need to uh, say, uh, we need to uh, do let's an oral presentation, sorry. so I want to thank you, let's uh, applaud our guests. Thank you.